Hi, everybody. It's time to start. If you want to find yourself a seat, that'd be great. I like it how you come to the front, most of you, and uh, we fill the front first. That's good. If you're online watching us, welcome. We have our first night of summer series, which is uh, Toby Levering's going to be here in a minute, and I'll read his bio. It might take 30 minutes to read that. It's quite lengthy. <laughs> But that's okay. He's been here before, and most of you know who he is. So we do have a few announcements before we start tonight. Uh, you probably all got this uh, call them all last night. Uh, Cage Hinsdale and family could use our prayers. Cage is sec a second grader and was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes last evening. He's in the Wesley Hospital. Roland Nuss is recovering at home after he fell on Sunday morning down here. Most of us was here to witness that. Cheryl Huddleston, sister of Deb Wilkins, needs our prayers. The doctors have removed nine liters of fluid, and they are not sure where it's coming from. Now, that's a lot of fluid. Uh, she's in ICU. Ron Richardson, grandfather of Lizzie Hansen, is having some serious heart problems also. Ethlyn Showalter, grandmother of Levi Clark, has had a stroke and is not doing well. Prayers are requested for her. So that's our prayer list. Plan to attend a come and go 50th anniversary celebration of Dennis and Edith Pearson this Saturday evening from 4 to 6. This will be held down here in the Fellowship Hall. Soup Kitchen is this coming Tuesday. We still need two meals in one, two dozen cookies, servers, and deliverers. Helpers are needed for VBS. Contact Jessica Wassinger or Lauren Lee Rawlings if you would like to volunteer. Uh, to walk kids to their centers, help with lunch, etc. There's a sign up in the uh, on the table if you would like to provide cookies or a pail of ice cream. So before I read about Mr. Toby, let's go to our Father in prayer. Father, we know you hear our prayers. We know that you like us to talk to you. We thank you for that, and we, we come with confidence bowing before your throne, realizing that you hear us and you love us. We thank you, Father. We thank you for the opportunity we have to meet together tonight in this assembly, brothers and sisters in Christ, as a family. We thank you that you provided for us, Mr. Toby, to come our direction and give us a nice lesson tonight that we can go home and be glad that we were here because we, we heard the lesson. Father, we do ask you to please be with Gage and Roland and Cheryl and Ron and Ethlyn. These people, all that we've named in our announcements, all need your help. And if you could, please put your loving arms around them and give them a big hug and, and help them, if you could, please, to, back to recovery. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have just to pray and talk to you. We thank you for the blessings we receive through Jesus, and it's because of him we're here tonight. Thank you for calling us your children. We thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die on our behalf. We're just thankful, Father, that uh, uh, we have an opportunity to be here at a facility that's nice and cool, and it's just a nice place to be. We thank you for the U.S. of A. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> As I said, Mr. Toby's here this evening. This is our first uh, speaker of the summer series. I'm going to read to you. I know most of you know him, but this is what I got. Wayne left me this to read. And by the way, Wayne's in Branson, Missouri. He's on vacation. He'll be back Saturday afternoon or evening. First time the guy's ever been in Branson. I can't believe that. Most of us have been there at least once. Okay, I think Matt lives there anymore. But anyway. <laughs> okay. Uh, he's the preaching... Toby is the preaching minister at the Northside Church of Christ in Wichita. He and his wife, Christy, were both born and raised in the Wichita area. They met while growing up in the youth group together at the Emporia Avenue congregation. They married there on August 21st, 1999. They have one son, Tyler, who happens to be coming as my junior counselor, and a daughter, Grace. Toby graduated from Oklahoma Christian in 1999. Before coming to Northside, he was the youth minister at congregations in El Reno, Oklahoma, and Phoenix, Arizona. He came to Northside in 2001 to serve as a youth minister. During those 14 years, he had a family-based youth ministry with a rotating parent team as the central pillar to all activities and events. In addition, he began, to, uh, he began and led youth group mission trips to South Dakota, Iowa, Oklahoma, and Minnesota. In 2008, he revived Wichita's work camp. Over the years, God has grown that effort to the largest uh, uh, Church of Christ camp in the Kansas with regular attendance of 200 to 250 students. I talked to my granddaughter yesterday, and she's going to be going to this. Yeah. Um, in 2015, he began transitioning with Steve Tandy to be the Northside's full-time preaching minister. Toby enjoys rock climbing, adventure, uh, 
skiing, bungee jumping. I can't picture him doing any of this, but this is what it says, okay? <laughs> okay. I'd, I'd be a daredevil trying to do any of this. In the case of, of the first four, uh, exaggerating his website biography. More commonly, after he wakes up from his nap, you'll usually find him reading a good book, watching Netflix, going on a date with his sweet little Christy, or playing with Tyler or Grace. Christy's a full-time mom and homemaker. When she isn't fulfilling those roles, she's usually serving others or working on her homemade jewelry ministry. So tonight, we are gonna forego any of our songs and the little devotion that we usually have because we wanna give Toby all the time that he needs. Mr. Toby, go ahead. All right. Thank you, Steve. Um, Wayne's on vacation? Vacation? Isn't he a preacher? Don't those guys just work like one day a week? It's, it's a preacher joke. You can, you tell him I said that. He'll, he'll give it right back to me. Well, it's good to be back at Eastwood. Eastwood is kind of like a second home. Have so many familiar faces from uh, years gone by, camp, uh, Northsiders, uh, so it's always good to be with you, and really, it's my honor to kick off your summer speaker series. This is something that more and more of the churches are doing, and it's a good thing. Uh, I know Steve always has a joke in mind, so I thought, when I get here tonight, I have to tell a joke, because that's what they're used to. The problem, uh, have you heard of one about the preacher and the taxi cab driver? Okay, all right, I'm going to tell it anyway, so <laughs> laugh extra hard because I, I don't have any others prepared. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, the taxi cab driver and the preacher uh, both die at the same time, and they get up to the pearly gates, and there is Peter, and he's got the books open, and uh, first up is the cab driver, and he says, well, Mr. Johnson, we have been expecting you. You are quite the celebrity here in heaven. He takes him over to Gabriel, and Gabriel gives him a golden sash, and they give him a nice big golden staff and put beautiful sandals on his feet. And they say, now right this way, Mr. Johnson, you're gonna, we have the finest mansion in heaven just for you. And they go off. Now, the preacher's seeing all of this, and he is excited. I mean, not to brag on himself, but, you know, I mean, he's a preacher, and this guy's a cab driver, so he's thinking, if they did this much for this cab driver, what are they going to do for me? So anyway, the angels come back, and Peter, Peter says, all right, next up in line, and he kind of looks, and he's not, kind of has this puzzled look on his face, like he doesn't recognize him, and he's flipping through the book, and he finally there toward the back, very, very bottom and very small print, finds the preacher's name. He says, oh, okay, okay, well, all right, we're going to let you in. Uh, we don't have anything special for you. We've got some used robes that are right over there. Just grab yourself one. Uh, and we've got a small, tiny little cabin in the back. It's, it's overgrown. You're going to have to do a lot of work on it, uh, but it's right this way. Now, we don't get any escort back there, and so... You know, the preacher, he's just kind of flummoxed by this. What is going on? And uh, he, Peter can tell he's somewhat concerned. He says, well, my son, what troubles you? You're in heaven. He said, well, I don't want to say anything, but I mean, I, I, w I overheard all that you did for that taxi, taxi cab driver. And, you know, you get in the mansion and the sash and the staff and the sandals and the whole bit. And then I've, I've given my life to the gospel, to preaching and teaching and working in the kingdom, and you, you barely even notice me. You hardly give me a sash. You give me a tiny little cabin in the back. I mean, I, I don't want to complain. I'm in heaven, but I'm kind of curious. What gives? He said, well, we appreciate the work that you've done, and, and we see here you preached a lot of good sermons, but honestly, most of the time, People slept through those sermons. <laughs> but that taxi cab driver, every time people rode with him, they prayed. <laughs> you can, you can, yeah, had you heard that one, well, Steve? I, actually, I heard that at a preacher's meeting. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> I was hoping well, you would. I had hoped you'd forgotten that. But anyway, okay, so how many of you, raise your hand, honestly, if you had heard that joke before? Okay, a few of you. All right, all right. Well, that's okay. All right, a question for you. 
I want to know if you had the opportunity to sit down with Jesus, eyeball to eyeball, kneecap to kneecap, cross the table from one another, and you could ask him about anything, what would you ask him? If you just got a limited amount of time, but you can ask him anything, and you know he's a son of God, he's the king of the universe, he, he has all of the answers, you could ask him about anything, what would you ask Jesus if you had the opportunity? Sure. Why, do, why does he allow things to happen? Why do we allow things to happen? Bad things, right? Bad, why do bad things happen to good people? Sure, yeah, this is one of the big questions we want to ask. What other questions or question might you ask Jesus if you had 15 minutes with him? Sure. What does my treasure look like? Do I get a big mansion or I got the cabin? Which one is it going to be? <laughs> what else? Sure. When are you coming back? I think that's a question we'd all like to know the answer to. Very good question. Well, we could probably sit for the rest of the, the lesson and think about and, and ponder the questions that we might ask Jesus if we had the opportunity. Tonight, we're going to look at the account of a man who had just such an opportunity to ask the King of Kings, the centerpiece of heaven, the foundation, the reason for all creation, a question. We're going to look at that in Luke chapter 10. So if you have your Bibles, I hope that you do, you want to open up to Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Um, and tonight, although in Jesus' life there were lots of people that had these moments with Jesus, tonight's moment belongs to, of all people, a lawyer. Now you think preacher jokes are good, the lawyer jokes are even better. I, I actually had lunch with a lawyer friend of mine today, a uh, good guy. Um, but this lawyer is not a lawyer in the sense that you and I think of a lawyer. This lawyer was an expert in the law, what we would call the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. He knew it backwards and forwards. That's what lawyers do. In fact, most lawyers have a specialty. They work in a certain area of the law and they master it. They know the, the rules and the laws inside and out, and this guy, knowing the law as he does, has a question for Jesus. So we start in verse 25. Matthew, or I'm sorry, Luke writes this. <clears throat> On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Verse 26, what is written in the law. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. Now, here's the question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, you know the law. You understand what it says. How do you read it? So he replies to him, this is how I read it. Jesus said, you are reading it correctly. Just do that and you will live. Now you would think that would be the end of the story, but this guy's a good lawyer. He's got a follow-up question. He needs to know. But wanting to justify himself, verse 29, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now, this was a, a bigger question. So, to give you a little background, there are, by some counts, 611 commands in the old law. And there's a little variation, but, but just north of 600 is what we would say in terms of the number of commands. So, the lawyers and the teachers and the Pharisees would argue and discuss and debate about all of those rules. How did you prioritize them? And we think of this today. We know we have all sorts of rules. I mean, we got a, a room full of lawbreakers here, and you probably don't even know the laws that you've broken. We have so many rules. 
Well, they just had 611, which is still a lot, and so they would argue and debate about which were the more meaningful rules. Did the rules about clean and unclean foods matter to God as much as the rules about uh, worship? Did the, did the rules about loving God, were they as equal and as weighty as the rules concerning their interactions with foreign people? So they weighed that and they discussed that and they debated it. They had come down to what we call the Shema, the Shema, uh, Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. They said it boiled down to this, and Deuteronomy 6, 5, if you're not turned there, says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. So he, he quotes this. He understands, and Jesus agrees with him, that loving God is central to all of it. It surpasses all other commands. And it's foundational to the entire law. In other words, if you don't love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you, you, it's going to be real hard for you for any of the other commands to make sense. You won't have any desire to do that if not driven by your love for God. So they said this was foundational to all of it. And then... Um, the lawyer asked this question in response to the second, love your neighbor as yourself. And uh, this is a, a quote from Leviticus 19, verse 18. And so the question here is, who is my neighbor? Everyone agreed on loving God. Now, let's, if, we, if we call the, the two great commands, loving God and loving people, I'm getting ready to do a funeral on Saturday for uh, a cousin of mine. She was 76 years old. And one of the things that I'm pointing out in her celebration of life service is she did two things really well. She loved God and she loved people. So we understand that that's central to it. But, but can we just be honest for a second and say that the first command is a lot different than the second command? Because the first command if I'm honest, that's sort of easy. When I consider that God, all of the world that God has created, the stars and the heavens, you know, I'm like the psalmist, what is man that you're mindful of? And when I think about the blessings that I enjoy every day, that I can see color, that I can hear sound, that the world's decorated with beautiful flowers when they're not blowing away, that I can enjoy the beautiful sights like the Grand Canyons or the, the Rocky Mountains or a beach out in Malibu. That, that, that God created all of that. And to consider even beyond that, that, that he made you and I. That we're created in his image with purpose. And when you stop to really dwell on the goodness and the sovereignty and the power and the majesty of God, I think you've got to have a pretty hard heart not to respond with love to, to, toward a God like that. So loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength is not hard to do. But loving people. Loving people is a different story, isn't it? Loving people is not always easy to do. And there are some people that are easy to love. I mean, it's just hard not to love them. They smile, and they love you, and they help you, and they do good. Those are people that's easy to love. But sometimes there are other people that are harder to love. Maybe they're grouchy all the time. Maybe they feel like their spiritual gift is the gift of criticism. You know, this, these people... I mean, there are some people, that's just, they just think it's their lot in life to point out everything that's wrong. Sometimes, sometimes people see things differently than you. I, I know that we live in a very unified world, but try to imagine a world that's divided and angry and bickering and debating and hateful. And spy. Try, just try, if you can, just for a moment to imagine such a world. Sometimes it's hard to love people. Jesus said, if you love those who love you, that's easy to do. 
even the pagans do that. But, but when you love those who are nothing like you, that's something entirely different. Well, Jesus is going to answer this question as Jesus most often answers questions with a good story. We call it the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's found in the rest of these verses, starting in verse 30, and so that's what we're going to look at. The debate of the day was that this idea of a neighbor was someone who agreed with you. Uh, what we might say, I hope this doesn't get in the way. If I move this, does that bother anybody? We might say that a neighbor is someone who's righteous. Someone who goes to church. Uh, someone who does good. Someone who has a good reputation. That was what they considered a neighbor. But there, there's people who, who aren't real good who don't go to church, who don't care much about the Bible, who are very different. And, and so the question is, do we have to love them? A lot of times we, we are quick to draw lines about who is my neighbor, and that's what this question, where this question comes from. They believe that there were wicked people. There was the righteous and the wicked and the wicked people were people you didn't have to worry about loving because they didn't love God or care about God. Now, the question then is, who are the wicked? Well, are they, are they sinners? Are they Gentiles? Are they Samaritans? Uh, these people were considered enemies of God for a variety of reasons. If you turn in your Bible, I'll give you a scriptural, what, what they would use as a scripture to back up their belief that it was okay to love but with conditions. To, to limit who qualified as a neighbor. Psalm 139, verse 21. The psalmist writes this, Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Okay? So, so, uh, so a, a lawyer would say, well, wait a second, what about those who hate God? What about those who abhor you, who are in rebellion to you? Do we have to love them? Jesus answers with this story that we call the Good Samaritan. So we're going to start reading verse 30. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. When he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan... As he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. So Jesus starts by telling the story, and the setting is the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, to you and I, that doesn't mean much, unless you know anything about biblical geography, or maybe you've been to the Holy Lands, and you understand this road. Let me put it in terminology that we would understand. I don't know, does Hutchinson have a bad part of town? Okay. Now, you probably couldn't tell me because you know it's being live streamed, but, but if I were to go to you afterward and say, hey, where should I not be after 11 o'clock at night? You could say, oh, okay, I can tell you. Avoid this area of town. You don't want to be there. Nothing good happens in that area of town. Okay, when I say that, you understand the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. This is, a, this is a treacherous, steep incline, and it was known as a place where robbers and bandits would attack and lay in wait for travelers going along the road. If you had to travel a lot, you avoided at all costs the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. It was the rough area of town. 
This man traveling is robbed, he's beaten, he's stripped of his clothes, and he's left for dead. Now, a priest and a Levite, priest and a Levite, could no more better personify the religious people of the day. They were both supposed to know God and his law. They were supposed to know, love your neighbor as yourself. Their entire job was to be devoted and dedicated to knowing the law and doing the law. And yet, and yet, both of them disobey. Neither of them love this man as their neighbor. But instead, they go out of their way. The scripture says they passed by on the other side. In my mind's eye, I, 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 can, I can see this picture, and in some way it's easy for me to get a little judgy toward the priest and the Levite. To say, well, you know, you guys, you knew better. You, you study the Bible all the time. You're supposed to know, to, to, to love your neighbor as yourself. But if I'm honest... I mean, I mean this, this picture that you get, if, if this middle aisle could be our Jerusalem to Jericho, and, and, and they see this guy right here, and he's stripped and beaten, and he's left for dead, and they, they're walking down this, and they see him on the side of the road, and, and they're doing what you and I do when we see someone who's not, like the, they're in a bad situation. And they have a, that, that thought process that we all have. Well, who is that guy? And do I help him? Now, now, maybe justifying, maybe they're saying, you know what, this is a bad area of town. That guy, he's just a ruse. Hey, he's doing just fine, but, but if I stop to help him, they're going to attack me and, and rob me, and bad things could happen to me. And besides that, I've, I've got all sorts of stuff. I am a priest. I am a Levite. I'm late for Shabbat. I've got to get to the synagogue. So you know what? This one time, I'm just going to ignore that problem and keep on going and be grateful that I'm not in his situation. Now, I can picture that in my mind, and I can be really hard on those priests and those Levites, but if I'm honest... I've done the exact same thing. I've been in ministry for 23 years. 23 years. I'm almost getting as old as Steve Sears. <laughs> now, I have, I have been, I, I've studied the Bible, I've taught the Bible, i preached the Bible, I know the Bible. I'm on a program called Know Your Bible. Okay? And still yet, there is something within me that I don't always take the opportunity when I should. I wish I could say it was 10 years ago. It was really about an hour ago. Before I got here, I stopped at the hospital here in Hutch to, to see uh, a man who is dying. He is near death. Those people in ministry have been around those situations enough, you know it won't be long. He was basically asleep. I prayed for him. His daughter came in, visited with her. I prayed with her. And then I left. And I had a little bit of time before I had to be here and being at the hospital. And so I was in my phone just scrolling, taking care of some emails, answering some texts, doing the things you do when you have a little bit of time. And I could hear, and it just kept going for like 15 minutes. I wish I could tell you that I put down my phone and opened my door and went out to see how I could help. I probably couldn't be much help. I'm not a mechanic. I mean, I can tell the car's not working as it should, but 
But beyond that, I, I can't do much. I, I mean, maybe I could pray and lay hands on it, but I don't know if that's going to do any good. I didn't even get out of the car. I, I made the list in my mind. You may be perhaps are better than me and have never made a list, but, but we come to those moments when we have the opportunity to help. And for whatever reason, maybe out of fear, pride, arrogance, or just plain old selfishness, we pass by. at someone else's problem today. The story is convicting on a number of levels. Because I can pick on these guys in this parable from 2,000 years ago, or I can look in the mirror and be convicted that not much has changed. Love, according to Jesus in this story, is first defined by what the Samaritan does, and it's in verse 33. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. I'm clicking, it's not advancing, so I don't know what to do, but if, if somebody, yeah, there we go. So, love first pauses instead of passes. And what I mean by that is the priest and the Levite had good reasons in their own mind why it didn't make sense to stop in a dangerous part of town to help a man they didn't know who was left for dead. The Samaritan did differently. He paused. He stopped. He didn't pass by. All of us are going to have hospital parking lot moments. And, and they will be inconvenient. You'll be on your way. You'll probably be running a few minutes behind. Uh, they might be scary. Uh, they will intrude into your selfish space. But if you want to be like the Samaritan, we need to stop. We need to pause because this is where we show love to our neighbor. So this new character has entered the story and he demonstrates something interesting. Look at verse 34. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, to take care of him. The second thing we learn from the Samaritan is that love means acting instead of intending. You've heard the phrase, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. We mean to, we know we should, we think I should call that person. You know, I really could take them a meal. I ought to give I should render help, and those thoughts are nice thoughts, but they aren't love until they're converted into action. Now, now the actions that the Samaritan takes are, there's a multitude. He, he takes out of his own kindness and compassion. He bandages the wounds. He applies medical treatment to someone. He applies oil and wine, which were the balm of the day. He put him on his own beast. Uh, in our world, that would be, we took this bloody, bleeding, bruised up man and put him in our car. He put him on his own donkey. He brought him to an inn, which is a place of refuge for travelers. Now, we focus on what the Samaritan did, which is what Jesus wants us to focus. His Jewish audience would have been completely locked up at the mention of the word Samaritan. 
Samaritans and Jews didn't get along. If you don't know about that, read John chapter 4 and the story of Jesus talking with the Samaritan woman. What are you doing talking to me? I'm out here. I don't want to talk to you. And besides that, Jews don't have anything to do with Samaritans. Why was that? Well, they had some history, you might say. Uh, the Samaritans were descendants. Remember the period of uh, the Assyrian captivity? When they, uh, the Israelites were taken off into captivity, uh, the northern kingdom was taken by Assyria. And some of the Israelites intermarried with the Assyrians. And those descendants were the Samaritans. So Jews despised them. They considered them to be traitors. They considered them to have turned back, to have intermarried with enemies of God. They had separate temples. It was so bad. They had separate places of worship. Uh, there on Mount Gerizim was the Samaritan temple. They were enemies. As I said, the, the woman at the well said, Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. In fact, if you want to learn, turn to John chapter 8, verse 48, the term Samaritan was, was almost like a cuss word to us. I thought about saying a really bad cuss word right here, and I thought that would be an unwise decision. So you just need to know that the term Samaritan that rolls off our lips very easily was a term of absolute, utter contempt by a Jewish person who was saying it. In John 8, 48, they level this accusation against Jesus. Aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? I don't know which was the worst insult. A Samaritan or being demon-possessed, but they accused Jesus of being an enemy of God's people. This Samaritan in this story is 180 degrees off of their preconceived notion of what a Samaritan was. The Samaritan was different, not by who he was, but in his actions, which were so completely different. See, on the same road, he comes up to the man. And he says, brother, are you okay? Can I help you? And, and he takes this man who's been left for dead and helps him. He, he does so much more in this moment and in the moments to come than, than the priest or the Levite. You've got two people at opposite ends of the spectrum, and Jesus is giving the positive toward one that they considered an enemy of God. So love means pausing instead of passing. That's what we're getting to. Who is my neighbor? Loving your neighbor means acting instead of intending. And then we read verse 35. The next day, he took out two silver coins, and he gave them to the innkeep. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any expense you may have. The next day, this Samaritan gives him two denarii. Now, to give you perspective, an average in of the day, according to the study that I did, was about one thirty-second of a denarii. So effectively, giving this man, the innkeep, two denarii covers his stay at the inn for a couple of months. Imagine that cost in today's dollars, what it would cost you. This was significant. But he doesn't just cover the cost for a couple of months. He says, okay, here's, here's room for a couple of nights, and oh, by the way, I'm just going to leave my, my card here, and if you have any additional expenses, just put it on that card. Well, he doesn't exactly say that. That would be the message. But, but, but you get what I'm saying. He's, he's, he's putting himself on the line here for taking care of everything needed for this. This, this Samaritan goes so much beyond. I mean, it, it would have been enough if he just stopped and checked on him just to see if he was alive and breathing. But he does more. He, he bandages him. He puts him in his car. He takes him to the inn. He covers the cost. This guy has skin in the game. He is loving this man as his neighbor. 
the Samaritan didn't just go the second mile. He went like the 22nd mile. He didn't just use what he had then, but he also paid the cost of any future expenses. The point of this whole story, well, it comes in the next two verses. Verse 36. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Now the question is, who is my neighbor? And Jesus kind of turns it and he says, which of one of these was a neighbor? Verse 37, the expert in the law replied, and you can, you can just see Luke writing this out, you can sense the hesitancy. He doesn't even want to come to the conclusion where he knows Jesus is leading. He won't even say the term. The, the one who had mercy on him. Can you, can you just tell the attitude and the tone in his answer? How many of you have teenagers? You ever give the right answer with the wrong tone? This is what's happening here. He's technically right. He's a lawyer in his accuracy. But he's also a lawyer in his heart, in his tone. The one who had mercy, he says begrudgingly. And Jesus, you have to know, smiles at him and tells him four simple words. Go and do likewise. Jesus' question was who was a neighbor? Not who is the neighbor, not who is worthy to receive our love, but who was the neighbor? We spent a lot of time drawing lines and trying to figure out who's in the box and who's out of the box, and Jesus holds up a mirror to us and says, I know you're concerned about who is. I'm asking you who was which of you is acting as a neighbor is loving like a neighbor the, the priest and the Levite claimed to love God but only the Samaritan showed it we have a saying around our family because being a preacher I get to I have this uncommon gift to give my children what's known as death by lecture. You say, what is death by lecture? You're experiencing it right now. Okay, okay, wrap it up. We know the story. Okay, that's my gift is the gift of lecture. And so a lot of times when, uh, when we're talking about something, my kids will respond with this, I know, Dad, I know and which every parent loves to hear. And so my response to their, I know, Dad, I know, is simply this. It's not the knowing that matters. It's the doing that matters. You see, I would guess on a Wednesday night in Hutchinson, Kansas, at the Eastwood Church of Christ, and all of those watching online, that there's a lot of you who know the parable of the Good Samaritan. Maybe you saw it. I was talking about it. You saw the scripture. You said, I know this story. But that's not the point. It's not the knowing. It's the doing that matters. When we talk about loving God and loving our neighbor, it's not the knowing. It's the doing. And so that's where Jesus brings us. Before we pick on priests and Levites, may we take an honest look at ourselves. Turn to 1 John chapter 4, verses 19 through 21. 1 John chapter 4, 19 through 21. Another verse on love. All of 1 John hits a lot on the topic of love. But when we talk about love, we've got to be careful because the world has hijacked love, that love is just this whatever you want it to mean. Today begins the first day of a month where you're going to hear a lot of people saying that love is love is love. It doesn't matter. And the Bible says something far different about love 
We're not going to go into all of that, but look at 1 John 4, 19 and following. The apostle whom Jesus loves writes these words inspired by the Holy Spirit. We love because he first loved us. You see, at one time, we all were the man that had been beaten and stripped and left for dead on the side of the road. Whoever claims to love God and yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever, whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. And we almost immediately, instinctively, just like the lawyer said, well, wait a second, John, who are you talking about? Who is my brother or sister? Are we talking biological? Are we talking spiritual? Are we talking the person next to us at the line at, at the grocery store? The, the person that we meet on the side? Who are we talking about? Are we talking about loving our brother or sister? And I think the very deep theological answer that Jesus gives is yes. This week you're going to have lots of opportunities to show kindness to a neighbor. But it's going to be up to you to do something with them. God gives us the opportunities. The question is, what will we do with them? Not what will we know with them, but what will we do? How will we act? These opportunities will be inconvenient, and you'll have to choose whether you're going to pause or pass by. These opportunities may be costly, and you'll have to choose whether to act or not. The key to love, then, is action. Not in what we know, not in what we say, but in what we do. And so may we all go and do likewise. Truth be told, I think there's a deeper meaning to this story than even what we've touched on tonight. I think this story represents the entire story of God and man. I think the man who's robbed is Adam and all of Adam's descendants. Robbed in the very beginning of what God tried to give him from a spiritual enemy that is never named. The priest and the Levite, God's commands, God's perfect law, that could tell us what to do, but couldn't fix our helpless estate. They saw our helpless condition and were powerless to change it. They were righteous, but they were unable to help. And Jesus is the truly good Samaritan who pauses, who takes on flesh, who enters our world, and at great cost to himself, putting his own skin and flesh in the game, takes care of our every need that we have or will ever have. By healing us, by providing us refuge, and by paying all of our debts. And if you take it one step further, I'll say this. I think the church is the innkeep. The one that Jesus entrusts broken people to. To take care of them and provide refuge. And to trust that Jesus will return for them. There's a lot of lessons from the parable of the Good Samaritan, but I think chief among them is the answer to the question, who is my neighbor? And Jesus answers simply with the story of a man who was a neighbor. A man who did exa exactly what Jesus would do for us and for all of us at the cross. So may we 
not just selfishly take the healing and accept the payment that Jesus gave for us, but may we, the church, take in all the Master brings us, taking care of them, looking after them, helping them to grow and mature, and loving them just as Jesus loved them. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, you are good, good beyond our ability to fully understand or even comprehend. Father, we thank you that in your perfect love, you've done far more for us than we can ever begin to fully recognize, understand, imagine, or wrap our finite minds around. We thank you for that perfect love, and we thank you that you sent your Son, who is the embodiment of love, who loved perfectly and who lived perfectly. Father, we acknowledge that he is truly good, that he has done for us what we couldn't do for ourselves, what even the law and the prophets couldn't do for us. We thank you for that sacrifice that he made, for the price that he paid. And Father, as we've been healed and our debts have been paid, may we, as the divine innkeep, continue to look after all of those that the Samaritan Son brings to us. Thank you for the honor and the privilege of being in your kingdom. May we not lose sight of the imperative to love you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. And indeed to love our neighbor as you have loved us. We know that you love us because of your son Jesus. And it's through his name we humbly pray. Amen. Aren't you glad you were here tonight? Yes. Wonderful.